Welcome to the interesting podcast number 203. This episode is with my new friend, America Young. She and I were connected by previous guest Tara Platt, and oh boy, am I glad for it. America is a director, actor, stunt performer, stunt coordinator, and all-around delight to hang out with. In this episode, we talk about her moving around a bunch as a kid, getting her black belt, starting out in stunts, making the jump into directing, directing her first feature with Stan Lee, what it's like to direct TV, taking on the role of Barbie, playing Batgirl in Gotham Knights, and so much more. To say that I had fun getting to know her is an understatement. So strap in and let's do this, friends. Please enjoy this episode of The Interesting Podcast, number 203, with America Young. Theme song time. is your day going oh my gosh it's that it's that (laughs) (laughs) it's yeah I I yeah I've had a few of those myself (laughs) yeah I mean it's overall really good but like it's only five o'clock where I am right now and I am ready for bed so (laughs) it's like (laughs) I understand how about your day uh good good it's uh I'm in Florida so I'm actually in the same time zone which is rare right um, why is it rare? Do you normally just interview people on the West Coast? Is that where all the interesting people are? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. It's like a hub or something. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> it's there's it's I find that it's been rare in in over 200 episodes now to find someone on Eastern time. They're either oh. in London or they're in LA or okay. I've I've recorded with a couple people in New Zealand. Okay. That was a whole thing trying to figure out the time differences. Oh, wow. So were you recording in like the middle of the night for you? Yeah. Yeah. And they were like tomorrow morning. Oh my gosh. It was like my afternoon and there tomorrow morning. It's time is strange. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. Like I have a I have a Zoom meeting tomorrow at 6 p.m. with somebody in Japan. Whoa. And is that ahead of us or behind us? I don't even know, but I know it's not the same day for them. <laughs> yeah. The, their calendar says something different. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if I, I'll be the future or the uh, the past for them, but um, something. Time's not real. I've, it's I've not given real. up. It's a construct. It is. Wibbly wobbly, timey wimey. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. See, you get it. I get it. I respect I get it. that, America. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I like that you get it, that I get it. Or you yeah, I get it that you it. get it. And we get, yeah. we get it. The collective we. we. <laughs> yes. The collective the we collective that no longer believes in time. And royally. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so you're you're in Georgia. No, I'm in New, uh, New Jersey. You're in New Jersey? What are yeah. You in New Jersey? When we first started talking, I was in Georgia. Oh. And since then, I've been back to LA and now I'm in New Jersey. Dude, you're just yeah. going everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. <laughs> Do you like that? You like traveling and like being? I, I love traveling. I I would like if the traveling maybe took me to places like New Zealand or yeah. Australia <laughs> or Paris or sure. the pyramids in Egypt. You know, like that's I I would like that. Um, but it's always it's it's always nice to to travel and go to a new place. Like I've I've never been to this place of New Jersey before. There you so go. That's something. A new new uh, new state to scratch off on your map. Well, I've been to New Jersey. I just haven't been to this city. I think I've been gotcha. to almost all the states other than Alaska. Really? Where are you from originally? Uh, Santa Fe. Oh wow, that's not any of the places we've mentioned prior. No, no, it's not. Yeah, that's, then, then I've moved. I was born there, and then just moved around a ton. Are you are you from from Florida, or is that just where you reside now? Uh, I'm from North Carolina, but I've lived most okay. of my life thus far in uh, in Florida. Okay. Right. Yeah. Where'd the wind take you, and why? Uh, you know, just <laughs> one step ahead of the law. Yeah, I I respect it. Yeah. You are you are on the right show, America. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, we moved a lot. Like from pretty much, I mean, moved my whole life, but um, like sixth grade to senior of high school, I think I was in a different school every year. You know, I it, it's turned out to be good because when you're working in the film industry, especially specifically directing in television, like you're always the new kid, right? So like it's you you learn how to adapt pretty quickly and and figure out the way things work and meet new people. And it's it's actually, it's been quite a gift. I liked it when it was happening too, but I'm really extra grateful for it now. Well, that's good. I find that that's a lot of people who've moved a lot as a kid is like, you have to be really good on your feet because yeah, all right, now sink or swim in a new place yeah. consistently. Yeah, especially in high school, which is already... Pretty tough. Oh, <laughs> and then add to the fact that you're the new kid every year. Um, <laughs> you know, that's fun. Um, but uh yeah, no, it's I it's a lot of it's a lot of interesting skill sets. It what's it it's also cool to see that everybody's the same everywhere you go. I mean, it's oh, yeah. cool and not cool, but mo- mainly cool. Yeah. And so it's like, especially now when this the country feels so divided mm-hmm. uh, by the color of the state, having lived in most of them, people are so much the same, you know? I know. Isn't that weird? Yeah. When people think they aren't. Like, yeah. We're, we're still humans at the end of the day. And that's something that we can all relate to, I find. Yeah. I mean, speak for yourself. I'm not human, but like everybody <laughs> yeah. else is. You've, as- you've ascended. And from humans I have observed, <laughs> you all are very similar. Yes. As test subjects, of course. Yes. yes. <laughs> as a control group known as humanity. I get it. Yeah. I mean, as I have written up my reports to send back to the mothership. Yes. That yes. Is one of my observations. Cool. Yeah. If you wouldn't mind extending my sentence a little longer, I would appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, okay. Cool. cool, cool. Yeah. I, I appreciate you. <laughs> I could do that. I could do that. You 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 were you were very kind and gracious about me being late. Um yes. time, so for that I will reward you with Boom. a yeah. I'll take it. I'll take any reward I can get at this point. <laughs> 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 From moving around a bunch and always being the new kid, did having a black belt give you any confidence in these situations? I didn't have it till after I was done moving around. Really? But I wish I had. I feel like it would have definitely helped in a lot of situations. Did you start martial arts after you stopped moving around then? Yeah. Yeah. When I moved out to LA, um, I started taking martial arts for like the Zen part of it, but also for the self-defense aspect of it. Sure. The funny thing is, is the person I trained under was all martial, no art. Oh. <laughs> I, I I trained under like the real life equivalency of Kreese. Um, oh yeah. From Cobra Kai. And so um, there was, there was very little Zen and very much Marshall, <laughs> but I, I mean, I learned a lot. He was a phenomenal martial artist, like the, the, the things that he could do defy all laws of physics. And I learned quite a bit. That's cool. Did you seek him out? Uh, I kind of stumbled on him. Like I was, I was meeting at a bunch of different um martial arts studios just to figure out where I wanted to go. And he, you know, he was, he was a diabolical man and um, that checks out. <laughs> yeah. And he, you know, like he, he said all the things I wanted to hear at the time. And then once they started training there, things changed a bit, but um, I met like, you know, some of my dearest friends, I, you know, because we went through hell together yeah. um, through there and uh, the, the skills I learned and everything and the self-discipline um, was pretty life-changing actually. I, I don't recommend it to anybody else, <laughs> um, <Sure. Yeah. laughs> but specifically for me, I made it work for me. And then, um, but I do recommend martial arts to people. I think, I think it's, or some sort of oh, yeah. you know, physical thing, specifically for women in terms of feeling comfortable in your own body and, and yeah. um, that kind of empowerment, I think is, is really important. I agree. Just to show that you can do it. You walk around differently in the world. Be like, All right, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, your limits are, you know, yeah. Um, it definitely, I mean, you not, not to say you should go out and pick fights, but like definitely you, you move differently in your body. And, and I think just by the way that you inhabit your body more, you're less likely to get uh, to be, to be picked on or victimized, just walking down the street, you know, like when you see someone walking with, with fear down the street versus somebody who's walking with confidence, mm-hmm. um, it, it, it'll make a difference over who people go after, you know, if they're going to mug you or whatever it is. So just that knowledge alone, I think is really important. I think so too. What style was it? Um, it was a Korean martial art cool. um, called Young Do Wan. It was his own 
it was his own um, creation. And um, it was, I mean, the, again, the people I trained with were phenomenal and he was incredibly gifted as a martial artist. Um, the stuff that he was able to do was incredible, but it was mainly, it's mainly like a lot of kicking. That was the main focus. Legs are longer. Yeah. He, he claims to have uh, trained Bruce Lee. Okay. Uh, you know, I don't, I have no <laughs> proof of that. Uh, there's right. a photo of them together, but other than that, I have, I have no proof of that, but he did claim. Sure. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, it was, uh, do, do you train at all? Do you do any kind of martial arts or anything? I did short and rue for a few years and I really enjoyed it. And then I okay. got poor and couldn't afford gas money to the dojo. Sure. Um, but I've now been training in Eido for two years. The September will be three. And, and you like it? I like it a lot. I mean, I've always wanted to be a samurai, you know, so I'm yeah, like, sure. I should, if I want to be a Jedi for real one day, I got to learn to use a sword. And here we are. I mean, you have to live up to your Twitter handle, right? I know, right? Yeah. I, what was I thinking past I me? I know. Put that mantle on there. My well, God. they they have a bunch of different skill sets because like you they still do. have to be able to fight when you don't have your lightsaber. So that's true. That's I, true. I don't think you were wrong. Yeah. But I do <laughs> think that this is definitely helpful. Yes. <laughs> it's the yin and yang of it all. Yeah, yeah. I feel you with the uh, the <laughs> the all martial no art as well. I remember yes. coming home from a short and rude class, and I learned this really what I thought was a very cool move, where you can redirect a punch and like grab the arm and walk back the opposite direction the way your opponent is facing, and they just you know their legs give out. Yeah, and, I, and it worked in class, which was awesome. So I came home and told my dad. Um, oh no. <laughs> yeah, and he was like, "Oh, try that on me." And I'm like. Pfft done you are you are a goner dad let's do this to this day i have no idea what he did i do know that i was on the floor in the living room <gasps> with my arm bent back and his foot on my face no, no pressure no. <laughs> no pressure but he's like don't do that in real life i was like all right thanks dad got it oh my gosh <laughs> Valuable lesson. Not everything yeah. works. <laughs> See, it, it helps to have a bunch of different styles. Yes. The right? Jeet Kune Do um, mentality. Use what yeah, works. <laughs> yeah. And and I, you know, I, I quickly got into stunts from that. And so I don't know how much of what I know, what he was teaching was absolutely practical. Like I saw him just take out people and he, he was. Oh, yeah. But but getting into stunts, like you, you quickly learn to, to pull your punches and just barely miss somebody. And even if they miss you, you take that reaction. And so, like, I don't know how honestly how good I would be in a street fight. I got a I got a good feeling about it. Well, I appreciate it. <laughs> I've seen some of your stuff, maybe. I got a. Yeah. Yeah, but it's all fake, though, right? <laughs> it's about the confidence, you know? Oh, okay. <laughs> They don't know that. <laughs> I guess I do have a pay good pain tolerance from doing what I do. You do? Yeah. And you have a good you have a good walk, you know? Yeah. They have to see it's the walk. The walk is everything. I'm just saying. I I, I believe in you, America. Thank you. That's it. That's Thank all you. I want to say. My dad was very much, grab something and break it. And I was like, oh, got it. Understood. Yeah. It's like, do, do this instead. Very, very martial. Very, very martial. Not so much art. So you're moving around a bunch. What brought you to LA? Did you move there like as a kid and then yeah, just stuck? Yeah, yeah. Um, I well, I was, I was, um, I was supposed to go to med school. Oh, very different. Yeah, and I got accepted and decided to take some time before I got in Smart. or before I actually went. I never actually ended up going. I kept deferring and deferring. Probably best. And uh, yeah, I moved to LA to be a storyteller, and I kind of did a whole bunch of stuff. And I liked it all. So did, was stunts one of the things that you were like, I should get into this? Or did it just kind of happen? No, I actually actively tried to avoid it. Oh. Well, I mean, I, I've never really been, um, I'm, I'm not like one of those crazy adrenaline thrill seekers. Sure, ditto. And so um, I don't think I fully understood stunts. I thought that you had to be kind of like jackass, you know? And sure. So <laughs> when, it, when it was first approached because of my martial arts experience to do some, you know, at first I said, no, I, I don't think I'm the person for you. And then the more I got to know it and the more I realized that it's very precise and very thoughtful and very safe and there's safety upon safety upon safety upon safety and there's all these mechanisms in place to keep you as safe as possible then it definitely and then it felt like someplace i really enjoyed being um so the first thing i did was a uh, touring stunt show oh, for tomb raider dude yeah it was really fun i really i mean i loved it and i got i, I got to learn because i could fight so and one of the best compliments I guess I got was that my fights looked sloppy and real. <laughs> <laughs> like like a lot of uh, a lot of gymnasts get into um, stunts and they mm -hmm. are gorgeous and graceful and 
phenomenal and bendy and I am not any of those things. <laughs> and so, so I look more like I'm, I'm the bar fight kind of there fight. You go. And, yeah. And so like, that was one of the things they said, they said, your fights look very gritty and real. So, um, <laughs> I, I, so I, I knew how to do that, but, but then they, but then they taught me how to do a whole bunch of other stuff for the stunt show, which was amazing. And they get paid to learn how to do, you know, high falls and slide for life and, um, uh, air rams and firearms and all that other stuff. It was the most incredible thing. And, uh, we toured around, the States and Canada putting on the show. Wow. It was a blast. It really was a blast. How long did you do that? Uh, I think it was about four months. Well, that's a long time to yeah. put, but to put that much learning as well. Yeah. And then, and then there was like three shows a day and I was, it was, it was a blast. My goodness. What was the recovery time for those shows? Um, did you have time? N- no, you had like a half hour, maybe <laughs> no. an hour. Yeah. Like it was, you would, because it was usually in the afternoon. So I guess we would do, that's a good question. Let me, I don't even remember. Let's see. We did do like a one o'clock show. The shows are like a dead sprint for about 40 minutes. Gotcha. And then you'd get like an hour off and then you do another one. So it would be like a one o'clock, a three o'clock and a five o'clock show. Goodness. And how many days a week? Seven. Woo! Talk about endurance. Yeah, it would be, no, it was two shows during the week and three shows on the weekend. That's what it was. Oh, that's so many shows. Yeah. And this was after martial arts. Yeah, this was after okay. martial arts. So you had a little little endurance under your belt. Yeah, yeah. And that I mean, because the test, like the test was legitimate. It was like a two-day test, and we had to, you know, run five miles in 20 minutes and 30 flights of stairs and fight three guys. And like it was two days long. Like it was get it. It was one of the things I'm most proud of because it was such an it's something I never thought I could do. Wow. Isn't that cool when you like put yourself to the test and you come up and you're like, look at that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is. I live for those moments, like to test to test yourself. You know, any sort of competition with yourself, because with something like art and martial arts as well, you're fighting yourself. Yeah, that's true. You know, and so like when you beat yourself, I find there's a special kind of satisfaction that you get of like, yeah, I can do more than I thought. Yes, that's you true. Know? Yeah, it's that, it's that magic sort of, sort of thing that like unlocks this other part of your mind, I find. So there's... I'm trying to think. You're doing two shows, five days a week, three shows on the weekends. How long was it from the time that you started to when you're like, oh, I actually really like this? Like, when did it click in that stunts were like a thing? I loved it. I mean, I, lo- I loved it once I started doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever have any injuries? Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you're getting hit by cars for a living. The things yeah. that are like, you know, um, but, but, but. It, you know, the it's it's so people are so careful. And as long as you're that's the other thing that I learned is is to trust your instincts and not to be afraid to ask to make sure, you know, yeah. sometimes people are afraid that to and and if if somebody if, if don't work for people who won't take care of you. Ooh, you know, solid piece of advice. Because there's a lot of people out there who will not take care of you. Yeah, that's a fact. Um, whether it be stunts or acting or accounting i mean you, yeah, you, yeah. <laughs> these are not people who are just taking advantage of you yeah is what's the key to getting hit by a car um it's kind of hard to describe without showing yeah okay okay and it's the speed at which is they're coming to you mm-hmm. it's where you pad okay some people put spikes in their elbow pads to help break the window Oh, but the the main thing is, is like where your legs are as your mid walk, like where your legs hit the bumper and getting up above the hood as it comes at you. Gotcha. Okay. Otherwise you can get caught underneath. So there's, there's like a Ooh. lift that has to happen at the right time that, that you kind of launch yourself onto the hood and up. Oh, okay. Okay. I love how technical it is. It's kind of cool. Yeah, it's, it's- Super, it's super technical. And I guarantee you there's probably a video about how to do it on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> YouTube is really, uh, YouTube University has really taken the mystery out of a lot of stuff, which is amazing, actually, as long as people aren't actually trying to do it. They're signed waivers beforehand. Yeah. And, you know, it's it because, you know, in stunts, everybody has their specialty and there are people whose fa- their favorite thing to do in the world is get hit by cars. They love it. Yeah. I mean, when, when you know, you know, right? When you know, you know, you can see adrenaline <laughs> rush and some people like fights and some people like the high falls and some people like the fire burns. And did you have a favorite? I like the fights. Yeah. I like the fights. The high falls were pretty great too, but I liked, I liked the fights best. Cool. How long were you doing stunts before you decided to start coordinating? Um, 
you know, I'm, I'm so bad at time. Somebody, I was Same. just talking to somebody today <laughs> about like, I was like, oh yeah, when we did that a couple of years ago and he's like, it's been 10 years. <laughs> we did that 10 years ago. I'm the same way. <laughs> and I said, no, no, it was just a couple of years ago. Um, so I don't, I, I don't know. It was, it was, um, I don't know. I don't know. I know that when the first job I got offered as a coordinator, I turned it down because I didn't feel like I had been doing it long enough. And so um, one of my dearest friends who is like my brother, he came on with me and we did it together. Cool. Um, and I had, I had said, no, like I called him and I said, you know, you should probably take this job. And he goes, no, we'll do it together. Like I, he's like, this is something you, I feel like you should learn how to do. And so we, we did it together and we made a really good team because he had been doing it for, you know, 20 years and, um, but didn't like dealing with everybody. <laughs> <laughs> And I, and I liked dealing with everybody. And so we, we actually, we did a lot. We did a lot of music videos together because we, because of his experience and, and because of, of, um, I just recently learned the phrase, I, um, managing up my ability to manage up, oh. um, because, because he, you know, he didn't want to have to deal with the director or the producers, or he didn't want to have to do the paperwork and the budgeting and the scheduling and all of that, which I, you know, I didn't mind doing. Sure. So I learned so much working by his side and us, us doing it together. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. And we did, we did some really cool music videos. We did, um, Janelle Monet. You did Chris Cornell. Yeah. Chris Cornell. That's right. That's right. I may know yeah. a couple things, America. Maybe. You may know some stuff. I'm impressed. <laughs> Yeah. I I actually have questions about that because yeah. that is Scream is my favorite Chris Cornell song. It's so good. It's so good. Yeah. I have memories of my brother and I like blasting it in our like car and him yeah. just screaming at the top of his lungs the chorus. Yes. So it holds it holds a nice spot in my mind. And then when oh. I was I I researched everyone but like for weeks before I even asked you to come on and our mutual friend Tara was like connect and I was like great and <laughs> when I when I found that out I was like there's no way oh and I rewatched it and your your Venn diagram of stunts and acting got to kind of yeah like how how did that happen I don't I don't remember blackmail got it <laughs> I've been hitting the head a lot Brian I'm sorry <laughs> um uh, so I, so I had worked with that music director or music video director a few times at that point I had done with him. I had done Katy Perry and Natasha Bedingfield and Janelle Monet, I think at that point. So we had worked a lot together. Um, and we really, we, we really liked each other. Um, I loved his creativity and his way of thinking and communicating. And he liked the fact that like, I wouldn't just say no, I would say no, but, and come up with ah. another suggestion. But, but so, because like, you know, sometimes they ask for stuff that's not safe or not physically possible or not within the budget or, 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 so the fact that I always came up most, he, the people that would come and go are the people who just went no to him. Sure. And the people that seemed to stay. And I didn't realize this until I actually, probably the Chris Cornell music video was, but as I say, no, but we could do this or this, you know? Uh... And so then that got him excited because then we could brainstorm something that made him that matched his vision. And he's just got such a cool vision, you know? Yeah. So, so, um, then there was, so then what I'm trying to remember now how that came about. Or how was it shot? Cause you fall through a window. Yeah. Yeah. It was, I, sh I fell through a window. That's how it was shot. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> check. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was a huge plate glass window. What? Yeah. What's the key to falling through a window? Well, it's, it's candy glass. Oh, uh... Oh. Well, there's two different versions. There's there's one that's like a candy glass, which just breaks more easily, uh -huh. um, and isn't it and and won't slice you up. Okay. Um, you you do get scratches, you do get cuts and stuff still, but it won't. It's not like tempered glass, which which will actually you know. Or the other version is if you're dealing with actual glass, you you pop it the second before you go through. You have little pyro things in the corner that oh. blow the window, so that you're actually not breaking it. But the timing looks like you're breaking it, but you're actually going through once it's already been broken because, because like something on like tempered glass, like I, I remember having to do a stunt for a movie and the pyro wasn't 
didn't work. The timing was wrong on the pyro. Oh, no. So we went for the run to go through it. We're supposed to fall onto the second story window into a fountain. Huh. As you do. As you do. <laughs> and we, in the middle of winter in Michigan. And, huh. and so we ran and they didn't pop, the, the, the pyro didn't go off. And we <sighs> slammed into the glass and bounced off. Huh. And then the pyro went off. And so then we went <laughs> then. And I was in a full body prosthetic, so I didn't get hurt. But the guy who was with me got sliced up and had to go to the hospital because the, timing, because the timing wasn't right. My God. You do have to be careful with that stuff. But that particular thing, it was it was candy glass. And then one of the angles, they decided they wanted to get one more angle and we didn't have any more candy glass. One of the angles, I think, is VFX. Gotcha. Okay. I think I know which one. It's in my head. Yeah. Like the one side, the side one, because it's I slow. Think, I think that was maybe the one, uh, because they had they had uh, on the on the fly. They were like, actually, let's do this one too, but we didn't have any more glass. Ah, uh, so we created the fall, and then they were gonna then we added that in in VFX. That's so cool! What a thing to be a part of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I got, it was really fun because I got a a massive uh, still of um because I just loved that outfit that I was in. Yeah. Um in the in the fog and the it was just such a cool they so I got that turned into a, a poster. Oh cool. It was, yeah it was a gift. So that was really cool. I love talking to stunt performers because they've done the most random things you can possibly think of. It's true. It's so neat. It's like your resume is clearly the most interesting out of everyone's. It's like I got blown up in a toilet. I got lit on fire. Oh, they have the best stories. <laughs> yeah. They have the best stories. Like I, my favorite thing in the world is just to sit around a bunch of old stunt people yes. and hear them tell their stories. You will never laugh harder in your it's life. It's true. <laughs> it's true. I try to have a bunch of stunt people on just for that reason. Like, tell me about a time you were killed by a coffin. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, I think they tried to do like a stunt rep men like round table on YouTube at one point. But the problem is some of the stories they tell, they can't tell the record. <laughs> right. right? Statute the, of limitations. Cause of, cause of, yeah. Yeah. There's a, uh, there's some NDA situations. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but their stories are just the best. I just sit and listen because they're, they, you just can't stop laughing at how ridiculous this, I mean, just this industry as a whole is so ridiculous. Oh, yeah. Like I was I was joking with someone recently that like, I'm surprised I'm not on a no fly list because of <laughs> things like Google. Sure. You know. You and Tara both. Y yes. Yes, it's true. I mean, yeah, especially with what she just, yeah, with her book with she her just book. released, right? Yeah. No, you're like the other day, what was like, I was Googling I wouldn't put a Google that was like, how long do you have to strangle someone before they die? Yeah, yeah. And then I was Googling how to make a bomb out of household items. And then I was Googling <laughs> how long till somebody bleeds out. Normal stuff. Yeah. Oh, oh. And I was Googling about cannibalism. Like, what does human flesh taste like? Because <laughs> I was working on a show that's about cannibalism. Right. So it's like, I'm, I'm on forums where they're talking about human flesh. And then like, what does human flesh look like? Like what, you know, because we have to make it look like human flesh on camera. Like there's just... Uh -huh. The things you're searching for, I don't know how I'm not on an FBI. I mean, right. might be. I actually might be on an FBI list. Right. <laughs> In fact, I have to be frank. If I'm not, then I'm very worried. Yeah. <laughs> you just have a special agent assigned to you that you haven't like discovered yet. Yeah, I hope so. I hope yeah. so. Because with the stuff that I have Googled, if I am not on a watch list, then then there is something wrong. Someone's very, not very doing wrong. their job. <laughs> Somebody's not doing their job because if there's somebody out there Googling this stuff for real, yeah. if, if somebody who was not a filmmaker was Googling this stuff for real, then we need to know who they are. Yeah. <laughs> Just for the safety of everyone involved. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I really do hope that the FBI has their eyes on me. Yeah. Um, yeah, me too. Because yeah, I'm not doing anything wrong. So I'm okay. But like, I should be on a watch list. For the for the, just the, the efficiency of a watch list. Yes. Your name yes, needs exactly. to be on it. Yeah. Exactly. I agree. I agree. No offense. I agree. No, 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 I, no, I no, agree. It's for the safety yeah. of all of us, America. I mean, you, you you might know what human flesh tastes like. All I'm saying. Yeah, no, I do, though. It should be looked into. So, so that's what's terrifying. <laughs> I'm scared of me. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't want to. The other day I had to look up what, um, what gunshot buck, buckshot looks like, like when it goes into somebody, but when it's like the spread out and you're far away from the gunshot. And so oh, yeah. the stuff I'm looking at is horrible. And then I found the photo I needed for reference. And then I had to send it to the makeup team. And I, I you know, I messaged, I said, I'm so sorry. Something very disturbing is about to come through. <laughs> for legal reasons, this for is a warning. For legal reasons, yeah. <laughs>
but also because like it, it's upsetting. It's upsetting to look at, you know. Well, yeah, and, I've seen Chernobyl. Oof. Yeah, right. That kind of stuff is really upsetting. So yeah, anyway. as it should be. Yeah. How long was it before you decided to direct? Because that's such a specific thing to be like, I'm a part of something too. I want to be in charge of this thing. Because there's so much directors do that most people don't realize. Yeah. And it's just so many plates. And like, I feel like you have to have a certain level of order in your brain or like organization just to be able to do it. Yeah, that helps. Um, I, it's funny because I'm not an organized person, but like, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I work very hard. Um, <laughs> But my, the first, like, it, it's interesting because in all the years I had been doing stunts up until that point, I had never worked with a woman director. Oh, so you need fill a need. Yeah, I, I guess I just didn't think, I don't know, for some reason I never saw myself in that position. And I don't know whether it's because I didn't have the narcissism or whether I didn't have, <laughs> I just didn't see it. And so it just didn't occur to me. I, I don't know. It's it's an interesting thing, but um, one of my friends, um, uh, her name is Faye Grant. She asked me to direct her music video. Oh, cool. And um, I I was really hesitant at first because it was her first music video. Ooh. And I grew up without a television. So <laughs> I hadn't watched a lot of music videos to begin with. And then I had never directed before. And, and stunt coordinating, there's a lot in stunt coordinating that is 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 very similar to directing. I mean, you're you're dealing with the casting process, you're dealing with the organization, you're dealing with telling the story in a very visual way. Mm -hmm. um, the best stunt coordinators, you, you know, you take a fight and the fight augments the story. It doesn't upend the story. You know, you look at a right. movie, warrior where that the movie works because the fights were such an integral part of the storytelling, right? And every move and everything has to do with the was character driven. And so there's a lot in stunt coordinating that's that can be that that can help support knowing how to direct and all of that. But I, I still didn't know if I, I could pull it off, but I, you know, I tried it with her, with her, with her belief in me, we worked in it together. She had a very clear vision of what she wanted. Cool. Um, and so, and she, and, you know, she's just a phenomenal talent. And I look back on that music video. I don't even remember when we did it, but you know, it was, it was cheesy. We did it with like not great tech or cameras. I had a pretty good DP, um, but you know, I'm still really proud of how that turned out as my first thing that I'd ever really directed fully. Yeah. Um, and so, so that was, that's kind of what gave me the bug. And so then I just started just trying to figure out what I wanted to do. So I just started making my own stuff a lot. Like, so, so I have a lot of shorts that I will never show anybody. And then I have ones that I submitted in festivals and the ones that are posted. I've seen them all. You have? Did you see the one with Tara? I've see yes, I've okay. We're going in. Are you ready? <laughs> Let's go in. <laughs> Where did the idea of, of a hundred levels come from? You had a hundred levels just in time, and it's so much fun, and it's got Yuri and Tara in it. Yeah. And it just looked like a blast. It was a blast to make. It started because we had a set that we could use, an old West set, where someone was oh. like, We're about to tear the set down. Do you guys want to shoot on it? And then Dove, who plays the preacher, kind of came up with the premise and he drafted up a script. And then Yuri and I kind of chimed in on it to like fine tune it exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we kind of, we, you know, we really were thinking about like, if we were to do a lot of them, it would be really, really fun. Yeah. Um, but it, I, I love the idea of the time travel Jumanji yeah. you know, situation. We all like, we all like wearing, you know, costumes and time travels and period stuff. And so it, it all came together really nicely. I, I really liked that movie a lot. I'm you really should. happy that that turned out. That was just so much fun to do with 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 all these people that I love. I love every single person in it is a dear, 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 dear friend. Cool. And the best people, the two that I know, I mean. They're just the best people. Um, and so it was just, it was just a really, so we had this just ridiculously fun, random set to shoot on. So we kind of worked our way backwards from there. Wow. Yeah. That's, I mean, location is one of the hardest things to figure out in a shoot. So to yeah, start with yeah. one, especially an old West one, right? A whole saloon and street, right? Pretty cool, right? And a stagecoach. I mean, I think that stagecoach is is authentically like from the old West. Like I think it like belongs in a museum. That stagecoach. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. So that's where that's where that came from. So that we just I just started making stuff, and then a uh, little bit by little bit, I started to actually say out loud that I was a director. It took me a while claim it but I wanted to make sure are you good with stuff like that like allowing yourself to learn oh allowing myself to learn yes allowing okay. myself to 
take credit? No. Or uh, yeah, yeah. to say it out loud, you know, like I would, I did not call myself a director until I had directed several shorts, an entire web series and a feature. And then I was like, okay, I, I will call myself that. Yeah. <laughs> Up until that point in my mind, I was just dabbling, which is funny because it was a lesson that I had learned early on that I had, a friend and I had written a web series and we had hired a director who said he was a director and then didn't, hadn't actually ever directed anything, but it would never have occurred to me to say I was a director unless I had. So yeah. it didn't occur to me that he, he, somebody else would say that when they had it. So I ended up like low key directing it just because it was just like, oh, did you, <laughs> you're not going to get the coverage of that person talking. You're just going to do this one shot. And then we're, you know, like that kind of stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah. This probably drove that person crazy, but um, <laughs> if they would have done it in the first place, I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah, they, <laughs> they, 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 they. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They misinformed. They were, they were false advertising. Yeah, they lied. They lied. There it is. <laughs> That's what I should have said. I'll say it. <laughs> <laughs> That's wild. We're cut from the same cloth. What is that? Why? 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 I don't know. It's like maybe because there's. As I'm kind of thinking about it out loud, do you think it's there's a because you care a lot. Yeah. And there is kind of a pressure in the ownership of it. Yeah. Do you think that has something to do with it? I do. I think yeah. there's an integrity in it too. Yeah, I think so too. You know, I mean, maybe if I had gone to school for it. Yeah. I would feel more confident saying it, even if I hadn't ever. Totally. But I don't think you, I mean, I, 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 but having not, it felt weird to say that I was one until I had established that I felt like I was, you know? Yeah. You're the same way. Yeah, exactly the same way. Because I also didn't go to school, but like I'm reading books about it and I am mm -hmm. learning all the time about the craft. And it's like, oh, right. Yeah. Why? And also, I think it might come from having so much respect for education. Right. To where if somebody does have an education, I'm like, oh, right. You have like you went to school. You have a degree in this stuff. Like I'm, I'm reading a book. You know, like trying not to. Yeah, but that's like the end of the Wizard of Oz, though, right? It's like you're as smart as any of those people, but they have something you do not, which is a piece of paper. Yeah. What's wrong with us? <laughs> interesting. I just realized that. How interesting. Yeah. Huh. I mean, you just got to keep going, right? And then eventually you have it under your belt and you're like, yeah. And then you end up having more work, at, like physical experience than the piece of paper. Yeah. And that's the thing is, is that having spent so much time on sets doing anything, especially when I first moved out to LA, I would show up and I would do help them with crafty. I would PA, I would do whatever it is just to be on a set that like film students would come on to the set and I would find that I was teaching them stuff. Yeah. You know, because some of the film schools, they don't actually have set experience. They're learning. True. They're learning the, you know, how to frame it up and all that other stuff from a, from a theo, um, theoretical perspective, but they're not learning the practical perspective of it. And so um, that's the other, that was the other thing that was an eye opening experience for me too, going, oh, wait a minute, you went to film school for this. And yet I, I know a lot. Yeah, you do. Um, and practically. Practically. Yeah. 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 Because things have changed and evolved and there's some things you can't learn without just doing them, you know, like getting hit by a car. That's true. At what point did you get confident enough to want to make a feature? Um, it's a different animal. It is a different animal. It helps that I was, I went into it with some good friends. Um, and it was just kind of just like, we start the the fe the first feature was supposed to be small and contained, and it somehow grew into something much more. <laughs> <laughs> the concessionaires must die with the title like that. Yeah! Oh my God! You're like the first person in the world to say it right. Oh yeah, um, I've watched it too. It's great. You have? I have. Dude, I'm I know. With you. Yeah. <laughs> I have. I I remember having a moment watching it because Yuri has always wanted to play Batman. Yes. But his vocal print doesn't necessarily lend it to itself. So you had him kill Batman's parents. And I was like, yes. OK, that makes sense. It felt like vindication. <laughs> it <right? did. laughs> it's a great movie. And it's your first feature. Your first feature is supposed to suck, America. I don't know if you know this. Is it? Yeah. It's supposed to be unwatchable. The worst movie I've ever seen. I'm in. You're supposed to have those. <laughs> it doesn't uh, it doesn't suck it doesn't it's really fun thank you it it took us like four years to make it Did you it? know like it's, it was you know there's that triangle of good fast cheap uh-huh yep. we couldn't do it we had to do it cheap yep 
and we wanted to be good. So it took forever. <laughs> um, but, the, but the cast is the cast helps. I mean, the cast was phenomenal. Um, my DP was gr- amazing. We lucked out like crazy with that theater that we shot it in. That was up in Fresno. Oh, cool. And uh, it had been closed down for years and they were just, they'd just been purchased by a nonprofit, I believe at the time. And so they were just starting to open up their doors again. And so they were willing to let us film there at a discounted price if we would work around their schedule for events. Nice, smart. And so it was cheaper to get the entire crew up there and to cast up there and put them up in a hotel than it was to shoot in Los Angeles. Wow. Yeah, so we lucked out big time with that because otherwise I don't know how we would have filmed it. You know, movie theater is not a cheap location. No, for an extended period of time as well. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's the, the people who built it were the same people who built the Pantages in LA, which is this gorgeous or theater. Um, And so it's just like, we, we actually didn't show how gorgeous the theater was on purpose on camera because we were afraid that no one would believe it was being shut down. Oh yeah. (laughs) But it's at the Warner theater. So like Warner, but OR in, in uh, Fresno. And if you were to look up those photos, the, I mean, it's just a breathtaking, the theater is just breathtaking, but I'm so, I'm so touched that you watched that, Brian. Thank you. Yeah. I watched it before I even asked you to come on. It's like, come on now. Oh my God. I got to know. <laughs> you're, God, you're seriously the best. That feels so good. Oh, uh, we're just getting started, pal. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you get Stan Lee involved? Um, I had been hosting a weekly comic book show for him. Amazing. And um, uh, his, his, somebody who works in his office, who's become a dear friend of mine, I worked at POW. I was talking to her about it and she was like, this sounds like something that's right up Stan Lee's. Allie. And so she, she actually is the one who facilitated his involvement in it. How cool was that? Were you nervous? Oh my, it was just the coolest. Yeah. It was just the coolest. And, and it was interesting because he was like 92 at the time. And I remember when we were filming, I, I wish we had made his scenes bigger because he was actually such an incredible, he actually was an incredible actor. Yeah. Um, and I, I wasn't necessarily anticipating that. Right. But like, he was actually such a very thoughtful and you know, considerate actor. Uh, but I remember we were, we were setting up to shoot it and he's got his, you know, every single second of every single day is booked solid. So when he yeah. showed up, he's like, what is our, what are we doing? What's going on? Yeah. <laughs> and um, I said, well, I, cause I had two, I like an hour, right. They're like, we'll give you an hour. Ooh. So, so I said, we're shooting, we're shooting this feature film. And he goes, Oh, really? It's my first movie. And <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, he's 92, he's confused. And I said, Oh, but Stan, you've done, you've done hundreds of movies, <laughs> hundreds of movies. And he said, no, I'm always just a cameo. I'm, I'm never playing it. I'm never a character. I'm always just a cameo oh. or I'm playing myself. And then I, I went back through And it's true. Like he's either the librarian or the bus driver, or he's playing Stan Lee in the movie, you know? Wow. And, uh, and that, so that was really cool. So for a while we thought about doing like introducing Stan Lee, Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) but then that required too much back backstory. So we didn't end up doing it, but he did, he did such an incredible job. Um, Yeah, he did. To have him involved in it. I never thought about that. His first movie was your movie. Yeah, isn't that nuts? His first movie was your first movie. His first movie was my first movie. Yeah, it was. It was Ooh. nuts. I I could. I was blown away when he when he said. In fact, I think I have a picture of me talking to him when he was telling me this. That my friend, that one of my producers took Zachy, who's just a powerhouse, phenomenal person, and um and you could see my face. I'm so like my the expression <laughs> on my face is like, wait, what? <laughs> but uh he did he did an amazing job he was 92 years old he had such a great sense of humor he had such heart you know and um it, it was I was thinking recently I you know I've missed him and I was thinking recently if I could go back to that footage and see if there's any fun outtakes of him or something yeah um because I know uh he, yeah he was great wow how special yeah to have something like that moment in time captured yeah that's so cool it's pretty amazing man how how did you get involved with What a Lark? 
Tara and I love each other very much. Fair. It shows in the series because it's a very good series. Yeah, I love it. I'm so proud of it. I'm so proud of it. You should be. She's phenomenal. Christopher's phenomenal. Yes. Whew. Think right? of powerhouses. <laughs> yeah. And the two of them together just gelled. And but yeah, Tara, I I she's just one of my favorite people in the world. And she came to me with this idea that she had. Um and I loved it. And I said, yes, anything to do anything with you. And we had done yeah. 100 levels together and had a blast. So we uh, we figured it out. And um, we're always trying to find something to do together. Yeah. There is a very deep love there. How did you shoot it? Because it's a web series where they're talking to camera the whole time. Yeah, we we shot it with, um, we had a real camera set up that, to make it look like they're talking to a web, webcam. But whoever was whoever they were talking to was in the room with them, just off camera. Oh. Oh, cool. So that they had someone to interact with. So when Tara was doing her side, Christopher was just off camera. And then when we were doing Christopher's side, Tara was just off camera. Oh, cool. Or or when you're talking to the sister or when you're talking to the best friend or the, the, the agent or whatever, they were always in the room for each other. And we shot it on like a, a soundstage in Burbank that had a bunch of different sets. Oh, cool. Because the, the most amazing thing is, is we really only needed like a backdrop most of the time. Um, so that made it something that would made it pretty fast to set up to shoot, but then we could do a lot of takes for performance. Oh, okay. Okay. But what made it super tricky is that it makes it really hard to edit into, right? So you kind of have to find that perfect take. Yeah. Unless you manufacture a glitch in the, uh, in the Skyping broadcast. Oh, okay. Okay. A little movie magic. I see. Yeah, but it's a true testament to their performances, right? Yeah. If you watch it. There's no editing. There's not really any editing that can be done. For the most part, it was almost more like a play because it was all done in one take, mostly. You know, like we would find the best takes. Oh, my God. I wondered because it's when you see it, a lot of people that I guess haven't worked in production will just look at it and be like, oh, it's like a live stream. They're talking to each other. I was like, there's no way. Like how just the timing of it all. Yeah. It is just oh, it's so good. Yeah, no, that's a great question. No one's ever asked that question. Yeah, did they just pop into my head? Oh, look at that. It's almost like you've done over 200 of these. Almost, maybe. <laughs> 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 Speaking of sets and stuff, where was that tank set for alt? The spaceship? Yes, the the room itself that she like wakes up in. Oh, there was a there's a spaceship set in um in LA that you can just like rent for the day. Oh, cool. Wow. Yeah, it's it's called Laurel Canyon stages and it's just a standing spaceship set. I guess somebody filmed a movie there and they just kept it going. And it's funny because if you watch a lot of like uh indie sci-fi, you'll start to recognize that set. Oh. It is used <laughs> frequently. That's funny. What a good gig to get into. Build a spaceship and just have people shoot in it. Yeah. They just they they, they, don't, they don't, you know, they just have to maintain it. And then people come in, they pay quite a bit of money to shoot in it. <laughs> and we at one point we had talked about we I have a friend, um, Greg Aronowitz, who made who's just a brilliant artist. And he was he's like, I have a spaceship set. We should we should we should do one of those. And I said, Oh, we you have a spaceship. <laughs> um, so we were looking at doing that as well, um, because it would just be a different spaceship since that one's been shot at so many times times like just kind of oh, make cool. it up a little um but it was right before the pandemic and it kind of all unraveled gotcha okay okay see i like i like now hearing your history and kind of putting the threads together when they kind of coincide with each other because with all yeah. you had some really cool fight scenes in that as well oh thanks which I really enjoyed yeah i that's what got me into the warner brother program was oh uh, really yeah, it was that one. Cool. Um, and the fight, my fights um, were designed by Fernando Chen, who did Warrior, actually. Oh, look at that. Yeah, Warrior and the Accountant and some other. He's he's a phenomenal, though. This, his storytelling um, with his choreography is just um, incredible. And uh, he did that. And then Christina Basquet, who played the lead, um, is actually an incredible stunt girl. She was Arya Stark stunt double. Oh, and, dude. Um, Game of Thrones and she's done a ton of stuff. And she was she was a she was a gymnast and her fights are so I mean that's what I was talking about in terms of so clean and so precise and lethal with her fights. Like she's so good. She's such a talented uh everything. Like, <laughs> anything that, that woman can't do. That's cool. Yeah, I'm glad you watched that one. Yeah, I really I had fun with that one. 
I, I did. And that's, and that's based on my sleepwalking. That's what inspired it. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> hey, take inspiration where it comes from, right? Right. right. <laughs> they say, write what you know, I've heard. Yeah. Yeah, they do. They have said that. That is true. Yes. The amorphous they might know a thing or two. Yeah. You Not know. as much as the we, though. Yeah. No, no, no. Royal we is where it's at. Yeah. I, I'm thinking back because you, you got What a Lark, which is a great series. You got Alt, great short. I'm a huge fan of Orbital Redux. Oh my God. Oh. Isn't that amazing? How did that come to be? Like who, who makes stuff that good on their own? Uh, what? Oh my God. Uh, Steven, Steven. Um, Crazy. He, that show was a phenomenal show. Yeah. I, I only worked that one episode really. Cause there were not many more stunts, stunts on there, but right. Yuri is incredible. Always. Uh, it was Yasmin, I think, right? Was the, uh -huh. yep. Yeah. She was amazing. The writing was great. Steven, what the hell is his last name? Steven. He only has one. It's like Cher. It's like Cher. That's it. That's all he needs. <laughs> um, like, and he he was just incredible. Every single day, he would like gather the crew and and give this like deep, thought provoking, inspirational talk thing, like to talk about like the topic or the issue that was being explored in that episode that day. And people just, I mean, it was, he was just, yeah, he was, he's amazing. And what an interesting project as well, because it wasn't like a standard shoot. No. Cause they're doing suggestions and they're doing basically a play, but shooting it and just. Yeah. And it was, I mean, it was, it was live. Yeah. Yeah. So to do, even do the stunts live was, is, was crazy. Cause it's like, ready, three, two, one, you know, and I had to figure out how to do the swap out and have Yuri climbing the wall and doing that, that stuff and having the stunt double in one section and the face stuff. It, like it was just, yeah, it was, it was pretty, that was a special project. I am truly shocked. It didn't get more attention. Yeah. It absolutely deserves it. I look for every reason I can to bring it up with anyone. Oh yeah, oh yeah. No, that was that was something. It's where can we watch it now? Right? It's it's, it's on where... Dust. Last I checked. Calcote, Calcote, Steve. Calcote. That's what it. What a name. Yeah, he's he's so talented. It's on Dust. Yeah, people should absolutely watch it if if and when they can. Immediately, that's when they should. I mean, the the old Doctor Who's used to be done like that, but they didn't look nearly as good. <laughs> yeah, it's true. To have something, what's that thing? It's like you make something three times. It's like first you write it, then you shoot it, then you edit it, and at any point it can go completely wrong. Yeah. So if anything's good, it's a miracle. Yeah. And to have that production, which is like everything cranked up to eleven difficulty, to still yeah. be as good as it is, blows my mind. It blows my mind. Yeah. It. I. Uh, I'm shocked that it didn't get more more acclaim and and buzz because it was it was really great we'll figure it out we'll, we'll we'll have a redemption tour somehow yes redemption tour speaking of things that uh change and like grow and then you add stuff to it and it just gets better and better pure absolutely loved it yeah absolutely loved it and the music music is amazing isn't it oh man it's one of those like how how, how? talk to me that 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 was Jason Wiestall. He is incredible. He's out of Germany. And he and I have been friends since I directed a music video for him a few years ago. And his sound design and his music and his score is just the most epic. Yeah. Epic's a good word. He's just incredible. Like I recommend him to every single person. Um, because he took he took this 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 very the short film, which is somewhat contained. And he made it feel like an epic, huge, epic adventure. It did. Yeah. Just the scale. Because that's what you want, right? With the stories you want. So you want some sort of scale that leads to people feeling like this world exists. And music yes. is such a crazy part of it that I guess a lot of people don't realize as much as I think they should. Yeah. I mean, there's this amazing clip on YouTube, which is Star Wars without John Williams. Have you seen this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you see these scenes that were like, epic goosebumps inducing scenes and then they take out the john williams music and you're like oh this is horrible I know. <laughs> this is so cheesy yeah it's true and that's where directing that skill comes in because you have to have the vision in your head of what it's supposed to look like at the end yeah just different different you got a different brain you you got to have a different brain. You got to live a lot in your head. That is for sure. For better or for worse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How'd you get into directing TV then? Is there like a lottery where like there's a bowl of directors for TV episodes and your name gets picked? It definitely feels like it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, 
I applied and I got into the Warner Brother directing program. Cool. And that in a, in a way is a lottery because there's so many people who submit and only a few who who get it. And and what's incredible about the Warner pro- program ex- specifically, and and it doesn't necessarily exist anymore. Um, it's kind of going through some changes, unfortunately, because it it was incredible. Mm-hmm. But the um you 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 get accepted you have there's a six week course to like take these working directors and give you specifically tv directing skills oh cool um or take the skills that you have and show them show you how it appears to tv directing and then um and then you're guaranteed your first episode of television dude which is sometimes i mean that's that's really incredibly hard to try to get yeah I bet. And so that, that was, that was the game changer for me. And so I got from that, from that, I got um, two up my first two episodes of television. And then from there I've been working and it definitely feels like I won the lottery. Wow. Were you nervous? Oh, very much so. Oh yeah. Very much so. Is there, how much of it is like creative based versus like technical based when it comes to directing TV? But it, uh, it's both, and it really kind of depends on the show. I mean, if you're if you're going onto a show that's been around for a while, it's it's a slightly less I don't want to say less creative, but it's um it's more creative within a, a, a an established structure. Gotcha. Okay, it's more like a well oiled machine. Yeah, because you see the show and you're like, okay, I know what kind of shots they use, and I know what kind of coverage they use, I know what kind of you know, like you're not going to go into CSI and try to do like crazy one or trans in camera transitions. <laughs> sure. Throw stuff. a bunch of Dutch angles in there for funsies. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you're, you're not, you're not, cause you, you know what that is, but, but you still, there is a lot of cre- creativity in the fact that you try to be creative with what within the box and the structure. Totally. So that depends on the show. And then if you're on a show that is brand new, like I've done some shows that have been like second, ep- like I've done a pilot and then I've done cool. some shows that were like second episode, third episodes of a new show where I haven't even been able to see the initial footage of what the other people have shot. Oh. And, and so in that regard, it's creative because you have an idea of what the show is based on maybe the pitch document or what you've talked about with the showrunners, but they haven't established or locked in the visual language of certain things. And so, so then that's where a little bit more creativity comes in still within a certain structure, because again, you want to make sure you're, you know, if this, if one, if the show is all steady, uh, steady cam or dolly shots, you're not going to go crazy handheld, right? Like that's not just the vibe. Right. Um, but there is, but, and then there's a technical part of it as well, but then you're also lucky to be working with crews that have been working together or at least have been working in this industry for so long. Oh, and yeah. so we learned so much. I mean, like, I, I feel like I learned something new every single day and that's really exciting. You learn new phrases, you learn new um, ways of shooting things. You learn new, you know, um, a lot of the shows I've been on have producing directors who have been incredible as resources in terms of giving advice and giving tips and pointers and stuff. So um but it's it definitely feels a little bit more like a um it's it's definitely more of a machine. Uh-huh. Sure. Because you show up, you prep for eight days, you shoot for eight days, you leave. Oh, that's fast. Yeah. Yeah. And my my analogy of directing television is like there's the train is already going and it has been going since before you got there at full speed. So your prep is you're running along the train as fast as you possibly can trying to get up to speed with the train. Your first day of shooting, you leap onto the train, hope you catch it. And then you spend the next eight days climbing on top of the train, (laughs) trying to get into the conductor seat. You finally make yourself, make your way into the conductor seat. You're like, oh, Oh, this is where the track is going. This is how the crew works together. This is how it all goes. This is the, okay, we got it. We've got our vibe and that's a wrap on America Young. And then they shove you out <laughs> and you tuck and roll and the train keeps going. Ooh, good thing you had all that stunt training. And yeah, they have all that stunt training because <laughs> they've got, you know, 10 more episodes to shoot that season. You right. Know? So it's, it's, it's definitely more of a, um, a well-oiled machine, you know, whereas with the feature, it kind of starts and ends with you. You're the last one, usually the last one standing um, in that one. Huh. Okay. So you're in this Warner Brothers program. You started directing TV. And then when did you decide to make Back to Lila? Um, that happened the same summer I was doing the program. Wow. So you just were like, let's make this more difficult by adding more things to my plate. 
Yeah. I had, <laughs> I had about five weekends where I did not sleep. <laughs> like yeah. I would, I would have it? a night. Yeah. And it was crazy. I did like, I remember the first weekend of the program, we had a night shoot until 5 a.m. I went home, I slept for a few hours. Then I went to the program at 10 a.m. I was in the program from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Then I went home and slept. I don't think I even slept for an hour. I had a 5, a. 5 p.m. call. So I, I got an, I remember having an Uber that weekend so I could sleep in the car. And then we had 5 p.m. call. We shot from five to five, went back to bed, slept for four hours, woke up, went to the Wonder Bow program at 10, was done by three, had an hour nap, went to my 5 p.m., 5 a.m. call. Like it was, it was, that was, I had a couple weekends like that. I were a little crazy. Get it. But it was worth it. Yeah, I'd say so. It worked out. You made another good movie in less than four years, I think. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I, that that one went that one didn't go as fast as uh originally planned. Uh-huh. Um, but it it definitely was in less than uh seven years. Like yeah. Uh, yeah. Seven years. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, and that one, you know, I my my the, the lead of that, who is also one of the producers, Gonzalo Martin, is just awesome. He was such an incredible, he, he and our, uh, uh, executive producer were such incredible partners in that our line producer on that Julie Bersani was amazing. It was just, that was a really great team of people. That's so cool. And that was nice. We shot that in LA. We didn't have to go to Fresno to shoot that one. There you go. Were you able, because you were kind of double dipping, learn stuff in the program and then get to use it on your movie? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. Totally. Right on. That's a great question. You ask good question. The key is I don't come in with them. <laughs> that's great. So you're just present and you're truly listening. Yeah, that's what I do. That's great. <laughs> that's such a great idea to be in a program learning because it's like martial arts, right? You yes. learn these forms, you learn these techniques, but then to be able to use them immediately is like, oh, oh, that does work. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, it was it was really helpful. And there was stuff that I knew that I didn't know I knew or I didn't have the language for or didn't know why it was good. I just knew that I had seen it done. Yeah. And so then to finally be able to put that into words and describe it in a way that was constructive was really useful. And then the stuff that I learned from that movie, I was able to then lead into my first episode um, of television, which was blind spot. Yeah. I, I, you know, I just done, done a bunch of stuff on the film, you know, that I learned about, you know, you learn, you learn something new every, every time. And, and that's, that's, what's incredible about it. And this whole time you're the voice of Barbie. So you're also acting. Right. Yes. <laughs> Team no sleep, baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even when we were shooting back to Lilam, I, I, we would shoot six days a week and my seventh day I was doing records for Barbie. So <laughs> like, dude, yeah, man. is that, were you nervous doing Barbie? Cause it's such like an established character that's been around for forever. Not really. I, I got really? it. Yeah. I got it in such a backwards way. Yeah. That I it it I never really felt nervous. I I I I got to team up with with incredible people um, who were looking to do a rebrand or or of her, and that we were all exactly on the same page in terms of the responsibility of Barbie and what it meant. And so to collaborate with people like that, like Julia Pister and Tails Sperling was like. It was a dream. And so it never felt, I mean, it, it, I always appreciated it, but I never was worried about like who she was as an icon because we were trying to actually undo that. You're going a, a, a parallel route. Yeah. Because, it, you know, at the, right before I started doing it, they had just released that doll that that got a lot of blowback about, Oh yeah, you know, and so, and so we were, we weren't worried about maintaining anything. We were trying to show what a phenomenal role model she could be. Yeah. You know, and, and what she could mean to kids. So we first started doing the YouTube stuff for the blog mm -hmm. and um, the stuff that, I mean, this is stuff Julia was, was writing and producing and Teal was producing and, and it was stuff that, you know, Barbie had never talked about before. Barbie talking yeah. about depression and Barbie talking about um, uh, bullying and Barbie talking about um, roast humor and um, Black Lives Matters. You know, we yeah. did a black, like, who would have thought that they would have ever have done Black Lives Matters? Right. You know, and they did. They absolutely did. We talked about COVID. We talked about like stuff that you would never expect. And 
I, you know, that was the stuff I was so proud of. I mean, I'm, I'm really proud of being part of the brand in general, but like that was just such an incredible time specifically because that's where we were kind of setting the tone for who this new version of her was going to be. Right. And um, Julia and Teal really encouraged me to weigh in on stuff, which I appreciated so much. That's neat. And you directed an episode. I directed a whole season. You directed a whole season of episodes. Yes. How was it directing animation versus directing like what you've done prior? Well, it was motion capture. Oh, what? Yeah. Yeah. The the first four seasons of the vlog were all motion capture. Dude. And so it so it's a so because I don't know that I could direct. I mean, I've never directed animation and I know that it's something okay. yes. very different. Sure. Um, but but so the yeah, it was we direct I directed the motion capture of it. It was wow. really weird to direct it while you're in it. Yeah, you know? I bet. Um but I, again, I had incredible people that I was working with. Um, Rosanna Sun was one of the producers also at the time, specifically on the mocap side of it. Um, and she was an incredible resource and ally through the whole for through the whole thing. Um, the first, so the director of the first three were, were Peter, and he's he's the one who set the tone for the humor and the pacing and the edit. Mm-hmm. And then I did four. Um, and then after four, where they moved to traditional animation, so they brought in somebody else to direct those. But um, oh. yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was fascinating to me. I learned so much about, um, you know, motion capture and that kind of animation and how it all comes together and working in the Unreal Engine. And yeah. so then from there, I was, because of that, I was able to direct the vertical slice for uh, the Resident Evil game, The Village. Dude. And which is basically, I guess the equivalent would be the pilot. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, so then they went on to make the game and then I did the, uh, the DLC of the game for shadows of Rose. Oh. So getting to do the Barbie stuff gave me the skills and the knowledge to be able to do the other stuff. So Barbie is, Barbie has changed my life. And I never thought in a million <laughs> years, I would ever say those words, but um, getting to be part of it has been such a dream. And Mattel has been such an incredible support. Wow. That's cool. And then you got to do mocap for another Barbie and Barbie Gordon. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah. I specialize in just people named Barbara. That's it. Everyone it's- has their thing. Like you said, stunt people, you found your thing. It's it's Barbara's. I found my niche. That's it. <laughs> Barbara's. How did that happen? Um, I auditioned for it. Cool. Yeah. Did you have to know how to use the tonfo before? No, they didn't even bring that up beforehand. They didn't, I wasn't supposed, I didn't know who I was auditioning for. Oh. I had a sneaking suspicion, but like, like I had auditioned at one point for like, for Yuri's, the Spider-Man game. And I remember going in, what was that? Was I auditioning for Mary Jane or something? But, and I don't remember what name that they had called her, but they, it's all under code, right? Cause I don't want it to get out. And so they'd given, they had given her the name like Margaret, you know, Jones. Right. And then like her boyfriend is a superhero in New York. Who's poor, who doesn't fly, <laughs> but still can somehow go from rooftop to rooftop. So when, and his name was like Paul. Right. Yeah. And so, so I remember even on in the audition on purpose, I would say, Peter, right. <laughs> I'd be like, Peter, you can't. And then I'd turn and look at them and wink and then continue. <laughs> it's like, Power move. I, I, know, I know what you're doing guys. So for, for Barbara, I was, I, I had my guesses. I had my guess. Cause it was a, it was a, uh, superhero without powers who had lost a father figure mm-hmm. and had adopted another fa- father figure and was like dealing with like, there, there, there was enough in there that I was, and I was dealing with, uh, and then there were other, there were other people she was with who were like infuriating, including one that had like rage issues and another one that was smart that she used to date. And I'm just, just like, well, I read some comics. I, I have a pretty good idea, but I didn't know for sure. They they actually hit it pretty. They they hit this one better than some of the other ones. And and to be fair, they're all really well hidden if you don't know the comics, right? right? Like, sure, they're really well hidden um, if you don't know the comics. So so um yeah, I just went in and I auditioned for it, and they had me audition for her and and some other ca- character named um Holly, um Holly uh. Quinoa or something, and sure. so, who has an accent, who has ra- who has um a, a bad ex, who has a crazy boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> Classic. Yeah, and I was like Holly, huh? Okay, so so um I auditioned for those both, and then I found out that I got uh Barbara, and it was one of the best. I mean, I was blown away. I couldn't believe it. I didn't think 
I think I would, I didn't think I would. I had been doing motion capture for so long, but I had never actually done a lot of voices. Um, and so to actually get to do the voice and the motion capture for for the a game, like that was just amazing. Do you ha- How long did you work on that? Because games take forever. It was a long time because we started it before the pandemic. Ah. And then there was the shutdown. And then there was a delay because of it. And then there was like the you know, pivoting in, in the way that they could to continue making it. And we, it was it was shot up in uh, the motion capture was, was all in Montreal. Oh, that is not even close to L.A. No, no, it's quite it's quite far. Um, <laughs> and so we were we were actually up there when the border started to close because of the pandemic. Oh, and we almost like we, had, they had, we kept having our flights cancel and then we were talking about like because all of us the entire guests were all from LA yeah and so we were like well do we rent a car and do we rent a car and drive back like we were trying to, <laughs> to get back. yeah you know the world was shutting down but finally we got on a plane that that didn't get canceled and we got home um yeah so it took a while it was it, you know there was a delay in the release and all of that because they had to because of what was happening like the the pandemic and just the so many things you know working against them Ooh, what a cool project to be a part of, though. Oh, it was the best. In the Batman universe, the game's really cool. Just uh, get to work with Stephen O. Young, who's super handsome. He's super handsome. It's too much. And funny as hell. Yeah. He makes me laugh so hard. And he's also a phenomenal actor. I mean, all of them were. Yeah. You know? What a cast. Um, the cast was so good. Sloan was so perfect as Tim. And Christopher oh, Sean man. is so perfect as Nightwing. Legend. Um, Legend. Yeah, he's so, he was so great. We had, we we instantly, it was like an instant friendship that happened that was, you know, and we all kind of fell into our roles um, naturally. Like we all kind of were just playing ourselves in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, but yes, no, it was, it was so fun to get to work with Steve. And Steve and I had known for a while just through the stunts and acting and stuff. But yeah, um, getting to meet Christopher and Sloan was really great. And Kari, who played Harley, was just fun. Just incredible. How can how can yeah. something not be great on the back end with that level of talent in the front? Just, ah, oh, I love it. Yes. And with the writers, the writers were incredible. Oh, and the director was great. Like, it was just such a warm, wonderful experience. I really loved every minute of it. How did the Chimera Project come to be? Um... 2011, I think. Um, my my two friends and I executive produced a feature film that was an anthology of six short films that were all written, directed, shot, produced, and edited by women. Cool. And it went really, really well. It launched a couple careers. It reignited a, a career. Um, and and we were just really proud of it. Um, it did a great at festivals. It did encore screenings. And so one of the directors of it um, came to me afterwards and, you know, told me how much of a difference it had made for her because one of the things that we had been learning it, and things have changed considerably actually since then, but at the time there were, there were very few female directors. And a lot of times women are hired on potential and men, a lot of times are hired on, no, I'm sorry, men are hired on potential and women are hired on accomplishment, right? which means that it's nearly impossible for the women to get that accomplishment, you know, because they can't get hired on potential. Yeah. <laughs> and so one of the things that this did is it gave all these directors a calling card Oh, cool! to get them future work. And, um, and then all of us together, we were a feature film, which helped in terms of getting a distribution deal or festivals and all this other thing. Yeah. So, um, um, the uh, one of the directors, Shauna Betts, had come to me and said, "You know, I, I this should be a thing that we do more. You should do these more regularly. We should do it together." Um, the other two weren't necessarily. One had just moved out of the state that I that I had done it with. Jen Fee had just moved out of the state. She was interested in still being involved, but a little bit more on the outside because she was no longer in the state. The other one wasn't. Um, I didn't want necessarily want to be involved in in forming the organization, but was supportive of it. And so we decided to bring in a third person, Sean and I brought in Cheryl Bookout and we made it a nonprofit because the idea was, you know, maybe it would be easier to raise money as a nonprofit. Sure. Um, and so the, the goal was always to do more feature anthologies like that. As we've 
done it. And as we've struggled with the raising of the money and stuff, we found different ways of, of still supporting people with finishing funds and yeah grants and, and all this other stuff that we had raised money from with grants, but giving people finishing funds and doing panels and educational things. But now we see there's a lot of other people who are doing the short film stuff, which is brilliant and awesome. Um, mm -hmm. Women in Media does one. That's great. Um, women of color, uh, Women Filmmakers of Color does another one, which is excellent. So we Recently, actually, we're just having conversations about what we could do. Um, and I think the idea is to really focus on mid-level, like women who are 30 and higher, who are maybe coming from different careers, Ooh. supervising or, some, or editing or something, who want to get into directing and, and specifically in a genre. Yeah. Um, because that seems to be a place where um, the numbers still aren't quite stacking up. So um, we're, we're in the process of like this particular year is, is kind of a, a, a reformation and a refocusing, but um, it's been, it's been so rewarding to get to do it and all the films that we've been able to support and help get to fruition and across the finish line and the filmmakers who have been involved. And it's been pretty amazing. And you actually did it. It's one thing to have an idea. It's another to follow through. Yeah, uh, it's exhausting though. <laughs> <laughs> A feeling you're familiar with, I found. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> At this point, do you have any advice for either upcoming directors or actors or stunt people, really? You you do too many things, America. So <laughs> Too many things. Too many things. <laughs> the problem is you do them well, so I can't even like single one out. <laughs> do, you, oh, do you have advice for anyone on their journey that's coming up the way that is wants to do the kind of stuff that you're doing? Yeah. I mean, I, th I think the, the biggest thing is to not wait for permission um, for any of it. Yeah. Because, because no one will give it to you, yeah, you know, um, it doesn't matter who you are, what you come, where, you, what background you come from. Um, no one will give you the permission and no one's going to care about it more than you will. No one will. Um, if you're, if your your agents won't, your managers won't, maybe your mom will. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. So, so you might have to just, you have to stay in touch with people. You have to um, constantly follow up with people, never get frustrated with them, never take it personally, but just know that it is your responsibility to push it forward. You have to push it forward and don't be discouraged by the fact that you have to um, be, be encouraged by the fact that you have the ability to, and that you are empowered to. And so that that's kind of generic advice um, that I wish I had known. And then in terms of specificity, in terms of the different departments, e each one has its own way forward. Um, for directors, I would say just start making your own stuff, even if it just means using an iPhone. But just you learn so much by doing it, not by reading the books. You can watch, learn a lot from behind the scenes featurettes from your favorite movies, but they have a gajillion dollars. So sometimes the advice they're giving is not applicable to you. Right. Yet. Not yet. Yeah. Um, but but um, just start making stuff and shoot it and edit it together and learn from that and see how the ways you messed up and don't show anybody and don't submit everything you make to a film festival because you've got, you'll cost yourself a fortune. Yeah. Just keep making stuff until you find out who you are as a filmmaker for voiceover. Um, voiceover is trickier because it's a very tight knit circle. Uh, just taking voiceover classes from people who know what they're doing. Oh, you know what? Skills Hub. Jennifer Hale and a bunch of other voiceover people have Skills Hub. Yes. And that is a that's an amazing resource. Agreed. Um, because because then you can get in contact with like actual working brilliant voiceover actors. Um, and so they could either give you more specific advice or help coach you or point you in more direction. So for voiceover, I see skills hubs. Also, Tara and Yuri, who I love with every fiber of my being, have a book. Uh -huh. I recommend um, uh, uh, voiceover voice actors. And then Aaron Fitzgerald also put out one that that is pretty great. I just forgot the title of it, but if you look her up, Aaron Fitzgerald and voiceover book, she has an ebook she put out. Um, so that's that for voiceover. And then, um, and also uh, Sound on Studio has classes. That's Kirsten Day. Um, she had, they have uh, classes that apparently that I've heard uh, people have been raving about. They're selling out constantly and they have incredible teachers on their thing also. And then for stunts is um, stunts just train in as many skills as you possibly can. And uh, it used to be a thing where you'd show up on set and hustle the stunt coordinator, but <laughs> 
really like you, that's what you'd have to do. You'd have to break onto a set, but with COVID, I don't know that you can do that anymore. And I haven't really done stunts since COVID hit. So I don't know. I don't know what that, that is, but there's, there's sites that you can get on, um, and just finding out where the stunt guys train, you know, in LA, they train at jam, they train at Tempest. Um, they train with, um, Simon Ree in the Valley and going there and just meeting, meeting the stunt people and, and getting into that community. Cause it's a very tight community and yeah. that's truly, you know, that's, that's the best way forward, but just, you, you just taking, taking matters into your own hands and you will have to send a lot of emails that start with, <laughs> Hey, I'm just checking in about blah, 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 blah. <laughs> that is going to be 80% of your climb. Yeah. And that never goes away. It never goes away. <laughs> uh, you'll, you'll always have to do it Yeah, because nobody cares about it more than you and nobody's thinking about it more than you. And, um, that's good. That's how it should be. I agree. You know, you say it's generic advice, but I, that's a lot of gold you just dropped. Oh, good. I love it. Man. Oh, good. And just like that, America, we've been talking for almost an hour and a half. You survived. Oh, my God. You make it effortless. You're very good at this, Brian. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. This was so much fun. Like, I knew it was going to be because we met through Tara. I enjoyed it so much. You're a blast. Like, genuinely. You like, made my day having actually watched the stuff. Like, yeah. I can't tell you how many podcasts I've been on where, like, I mean, this is, you just, you're, I'm glowing because of you. Thank you so much. I'm here for you, America. This is this is what yeah, it's about. you really are, man. I believe it. So that, that being said, before I release you back into the wild, I got to ask, where can people find you online? Where can they find your stuff? Talk to me. All right. Um, I am America underscore young on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok, although I wouldn't bother with TikTok. There's nothing there. <laughs> so I just stick to Instagram and Twitter. Um, and then my website is americayoung.com, but uh, socials, I'm always posting the stuff on socials to see things. And there's some really exciting things that I've directed that are coming out in the next year or so. So I'm really excited for people to see those. I'm excited too. It's going to be the best. America, you're, you're fantastic. You're the best. Stop you're it. You're fantastic. <laughs> and... Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter and Instagram. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at brianbalance.com. There you'll find my demos, short films, and a bunch of other really fun stuff. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps and is greatly appreciated. Let the people know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to pick you up some sweet gear. Also, I've made a Patreon, so if you'd like to support the show more directly and get early releases of the show, you now have that option over at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Daryl, Daz, Ben, and Chris. Your support means so much to me, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.